everyone, and thank you for being here, family members, adopted family members, friends. And I have to acknowledge the presence of the great Judith Jamison, Artistic Director Emeritus of Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, and like tonight's guest, an artist of uncompromising originality. And like Ms. Jamison, tonight's guest um, lives by the dictum, you don't belong by trying to belong, you belong by being who you are. Now to understand what a revolutionary stance that is, I take you back to the New York theater scene in the 1980s. The AIDS epidemic is beginning to ravage the creative community. Serious theater is just beginning to address the crisis and indeed the existence of homosexuals. The great white way is great, but very white. Uh, if you are African American, you're either in a jazz musical review or you're Debbie Allen and Sweet Charity, or you're unemployed. And there's really not much going on. Onto this scene erupts a brand new voice in 1986 from the stage of Joseph Papp's public theater. The Colored Museum exploded every trope and stereotype and sacred cow of the depiction of African Americans on stage up until that point. It even skewered that sacred, sacred cow, uh, a raisin in the sun. Its author was a 32-year-old, newly minted MFA graduate of NYU and a son of Frankfort, Kentucky, George C. Wolfe. George Wolfe's American theater revolution had begun. In 1993, he went on to become the first African-American director to direct a non-black uh, play on Broadway. It was the original production of Angels in America, for which he won the Tony. In 1992, he expanded the possibilities of African-American jazz musicals by daring to unflinchingly explore the dark side of Jelly Roll Morton in Jelly's Last Jam. This was a man of mixed race who claimed to have invented jazz while denying his African-American heritage. He continued to use musical theater to explore the African-American diaspora and its odyssey in such incredible pieces as Bring On to Noise, Bring On to Funk, for which he won his second Tony, and uh, 2016's wonderful Shuffle Along. And in between there, there was also The Wild Party. He created two of these musicals while running the public theater, uh, which he headed for 11 years. And during his tenure from 1994 to 2005, the public theater became an incubator for innovative and diverse voices, ranging from Suzanne Laurie Parks to Adam Gettles. He also made it a home for theater that reflected the diversity of America, the cultural clashes of America, and also our political tensions and problems. Little did we know that we would look back with such longing to that time, right? <laughs> These seems like the good old days. Oh, if only we could have Bush and Cheney back, we'd be so happy. <laughs> it's just amazing. Anyway, what, what a difference a decade makes. Uh, but I digress. <laughs> Back to George. After leaving uh, the public theater, he turned his talents to uh, the silver screen, directing the beautiful Lackawanna Blues, and uh, more recently, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. His latest production on Broadway, the stunning revival of The Iceman Cometh, starring Denzel Washington, garnered him yet more, another Tony nomination and many, many nominations for the piece. And though the play is set in 1912, it has a lot to say about where we are in America today. On a personal note, I have to say, my mother was in one of those jazz age jukebox music musicals of the 1970s. She starred in Bubbling Brown Sugar. 
And uh, night after night, she would glitter and be yay, bedecked in 50 pounds of bugle beads, and she and her co-stars would belt out jazz and blues standards without ever being able to acknowledge the crucible of fire which had forged their artistic chops without ever being able to acknowledge the pain. George Wolfe has said that every time you do something, you reclaim a piece of yourself for someone who came before you, who had to leave it behind in order to survive. And this is what George has been doing for nearly 40 years, reclaiming for all of us that which has been left behind and creating in theater a space of sacred ritual where we can face our demons, the ghosts of our history, and our various hearts of darkness, and perhaps find a way to wholeness and to recover our full humanity. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome George Wolfe. That introduction, I should quit, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Downhill from here. <laughs> well, you've accomplished a lot. I mean, you really could afford to just say, I'm done. No, I'm, okay. Off to Monte Carlo. Exactly, exactly. So um, one of the things, you had a saying above your desk, I understand, when you were writing Jelly's Last Jam that said, honor the source, which is, of course, what Jelly didn't do. Mm -hmm, he, mm -hmm. he said, I'm French, yes. I'm African, not me. Yes. Uh, so let's talk about your sources, okay. because like many uh, people from a bourgeois background, you had this kind of duality. There you were in Kentucky, mm -hmm. and yet your family created this cocoon of culture and education. Your mother ran a private African-American school. Public school, privileged principal, yep. yes. And uh, your father worked in the government, yeah. and you're this incredible grandmother. So please tell us about this beautiful environment that spawned you? Well, in some respects, I, I, my town, Frankfurt, uh, was, was segregated for the first eight years of my life. Mm -hmm. And so part of this cocoon was so that I, for I didn't view any as, I, I, so that I felt no sense of lacking or yeah. less than. Mm -hmm. And also, I remember, I mean, it was, in some respects, it was, it was an indoctrination uh, situation because I remember in, in grade school, they would, you know, you would learn, a black man invented the, the traffic light, and a black man <laughs> did this, and this did this, and we had one of those records of great moments in Negro history, you know, <laughs> in dup, 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 Christmas attics, blah, 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 and it was all this, these thoughts that were placed inside of your head so that therefore when you went into the world, the definition of what other people had for you had nothing to do with your definition of yourself. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and it was, and, and, and it was, and every corner, it was not just school, but it was church, it was the family, every, every aspect was about uh, building this sense of self-worth so that therefore, you may have been insecure about, you know, you know, I, you know, I worked, I started wearing glasses when I was eight, and the girl, my girlfriend at the time, broke up with me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Turns out it, it, that was for naw, but uh, <laughs> you know, but 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 the, but so I was dealing with that kind of trauma. Exactly. I was dealing with that kind of idiotic trauma instead of who am I and 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 am, and I, am I worthy, worthy of and am, am I equal? That was never for one second. And at the same time, there was also this incredibly psychotic thing, which is know that you are special, but don't think you're better than anybody else. And that was a really fascinating dance. In your head. In my head. Um, and, 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 and I remember at one point, I then, I, I, so, I went to, so I went to Rosenwald School, which is where my, my mother was a principal. She was a principal when I was there. Was there, and then I went. And then I went to Frankfurt High School, which was a public school and it was predominantly white. And I remember there was this, this fascinating shift in dynamic because any. I, I remember this startling moment 
when we were at Rosenwald, we were invited to another PPTA invited our, 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 us to come be there, and we were singing this song. And this was this was this was this was this one of those incredible moments. I have two moments that I think that defined my aesthetic. My my first one was I remember I remember people tell me I don't remember this, but I do. I was sitting on a little rug, and my grandfather, who I'm named after, George Wolfe, would build up blocks. Mm -hmm. And I'd knock them down with my hand, and he'd applaud me. <laughs> and and that is that is the, my, one of my earliest earliest memories. So and the, are there writers who feel that way in terms of how you treated their plays? Absolutely <laughs> not. I'm deeply nurturing. I'm just I'm absolutely <laughs> deeply nurturing. You know. But the other thing was that we were invited to this PTA, and it was about six of us, and we were singing this song. And this the principal at the time, this woman named Minnie J. Hitch, said we were singing this song. And, this, and the lyrics were, and I don't remember anything that follows this, the last line, these truths we are declaring that all men are the same, that liberty is a torch burning with a steady flame. And she told us that when we sang, and liberty is a torch burning with a steady flame, if mm -hmm. we sang this song with ferocity and commitment, mm -hmm. we would shatter all the racism in the room. <laughs> what a beautiful, magical song. Exactly, so I literally remember, and there, there were three or four lines that followed that song. I cannot tell you what they were, but I remember just these truths we are declaring that all men are the same. That everybody is a torch. He was just <laughs> throwing, but it's, but an astonishing, but it was an astonishing thing that someone told me, told us at a very young age, if you ferociously commit to language, and to song. And to song and 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 imbue it with heart and defiance, you can change the world. And that's what you've been doing. Well, for stupidly 40 years. or foolishly <laughs> believing that that's what I could do. You know, so falling into that, but that but it, so it wasn't it, 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 I mean, what was it? I was 11, 12. It was yes. an astonishing, when I look back on it, what an astonishing, wonderful thing to tell these, to tell somebody that young that they had that power. No, exactly, and that you've carried that forward. And the other person who instilled that power was your grandmother, oh, Addie yeah. President. Yes, Addie who... Parker Lindsay President. <laughs> yes, she... I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the other Exactly, names. no, yes. And she kept snakes in formaldehyde by the door. Oh my goodness, you've been done. doing, yes, absolutely. So to ward and off evil spirits. Evil spirits, and also anytime anybody bothered me or said anything, she would confront them. So I, so I was able to live inside of this creative bubble that's what you've said is exactly. that she gave you a childhood. Exactly, a childhood where I, could, I think I lived so long inside. I, did, I didn't have any, in some respects, I had no weapons of survival. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to survive. I didn't know how to defend myself because I didn't have to. Mm -hmm. So as a result of it, I think I lived inside of this childlike sense of imagination and play for an extraordinary long time. And, the, and, and, and I had this belief that she could and would do anything because your parents you know your parents are negotiating a relationship yes. with you and the world but there was she was this mythic figure who could mm -hmm. do anything except for when I was obsessed with Walt Disney um, and 101 Dalmatians came to town came mm -hmm. to town to the Capitol Theater and and the Capitol Theater was segregated at the time and she, I remember very specifically stand, telling her I wanted to go see it mm -hmm. and her calling up there to see if I could go. And this was sort of the first time that her magical power. Exactly. I saw her in the presence of a no. Mm -hmm. And it was, I, it, I mean, I, very spe I remember where I was, you know, I, where I was standing, this, the, the, the chair she was sitting in, every single, every single thing and mm -hmm. about that moment. And, and, and there are these moments that, you, you know, there are these moments I remember coming to uh, New York when I was 12 with my mother, who was taking some advanced degree work at NYU, and seeing West Side Story at the State Theater. And I remember leaning forward in the quintet, which happens just before the rumble. The Tonight Tonight. Exactly. And, and, and I remember leaning forward, studying it. At the time, I didn't know that I was studying it as a director. Because you were going to be a director. As a director, but that's what brain was working. And I remember that moment with my grandmother and realizing I was in the presence of something very powerful and very unsettling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and Absolutely. not fully understanding everything about the moment, but, but it stayed. It stayed. And, 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 I, and I understood something, and, and something resonated permanently mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. inside of me. So let's talk about 
that in the transition to becoming a writer and a director, you have said that you stumbled into writing because you were directing, but you weren't finding pieces about African Americans that resonated for you. It was sort of yeah. I was, all... I was I was I was I was I was in college and I was and I was directing. Well, actually, truth be told, I really all along I think I wanted to be a writer, but I didn't have the courage to call myself okay. one. Mm -hmm. So that therefore. In some respects, being a being a director and saying I was looking for material was true, but it also allowed me to sneak into the room and become a writer without <laughs> daring to say I'm a writer. You know what I mean? I said, Well, I have to do this, this. so I can get myself material to direct. It was my yes. way of sneaking in there, but it, it was, you know, I, I I found I found my household kind of crazy and insane. And, and magical and, and magical and insane and <laughs> and not normal Yet. and but anything I was but I but I found that there was a, at the time a lot of the plays that were available, available to me were social realism and and somehow that I didn't know how to I, part of my imagination could show up but then a part of my imagination had to stay out of the room mm -hmm. so I was looking to try to craft something where all of me could show up or as mm -hmm. much of me as possibly can and i think that's that's what the creative process is really about you you're looking to you're looking to work on projects where as much of you can be can come into the room exactly. and be present no and you weren't feeling reflected in those what you call it, the last a, black mom on the couch play yes yes yes, so, yes yeah <laughs> let's talk a bit about your your process i know sometimes when you're directing there's a story that when you were directing blade to the heat which is about boxers you were actually in boxers <laughs> with with the cast members just really getting into it what is your writing process what where does it start where do you where do you find a character like the raj character in the colored museum do these people come to you in dreams do you what's they i, I don't really know i remember i was at nyu i was in the dramatic writing program in the musical theater program i remember in the dramatic writing program there were about three or four people writing plays about mm -hmm. old black tap dancers and they were neither they weren't old black or tap dancers so i was just like going i, I so i said it was sort of mr bojangles meets something else and i was as fascinated by oh that means somebody has figured out what black is mm -hmm. well i'm black and i haven't figured that shit out so it was like I, 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 I was I was just baffled by that, and so. And you were the only, it must be pointed out, the only black student in the program at that point. I, I think there were maybe one or two or three, I mean, in the musical theater program, for sure. Right. For sure, yes, yes, yes. That's a, that will, chapter will be in the book, and um, <laughs> once a few people are dead, but um, I'm not wishing them death, but I, once they're dead, um, and. And so I, so I, I, it, I went. So what is this thing? And so I really wanted to. So, so Color Museum sprang forth from that. Yeah. And, um, and I don't know. And I, you know, and then I just started. And I was, you know, and I was, and, and then all of a sudden I'm, I'm thinking about writing about slavery. But then instead, it came to me this image of this stewardess named Miss Pat, who's teaching you know, slaves, how to become American Negroes. And I was yes. just sort of like, and, and, and the stories just kept coming from this weird play, place. And, and, I, and I, it was very much so. I remember I showed one or two of the early exhibits to a, a producer, a, a black producer in New York. And he said, well, Miss Pat needs to come back at the end of the play and say she was wrong and admit her guilt in trans, helping to transport slaves. And I was just thinking, this no, and so I realized <laughs> I wrote Colored Museum so I so as to give myself permission to write anything mm -hmm. after that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So because I wanted to, I wanted to break things. I wanted yep. to knock down those blocks. I wanted to knock down those blocks so that my brain felt permission to go in any direction. Well, and that's a very difficult thing often for writers of color because there is all this weight of responsibility you're going to insult these people it's just whom do we bring into the room and i wanted to ask you because you you were criticized by many black people for colored museum there were oh, actors they tried to be boycotts yeah. oh yeah yeah yes. so uh and there no, were I remember, I remember, there was this actress who i adored who 
who I adored, who I'd seen in a number of plays, and, yep. and we were having auditions. It's funny now, at the time it was painful. <laughs> Amazing how that works, and I was so excited when she, because I wanted her to come in and read for Miss Patton, it was auditions at the public, and she walked into the room, and she had the script, and she went, I can't <laughs> read this, and she stormed out. It was just sort of like, it, you know, because it was... Is she calling you now saying, do you have any gigs no, for we, me? No, we, 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 we made up since then, but, but I realized I was trafficking right. in silhouettes and, 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 and in... Well, and in very politically incorrect. Exactly. And you were skewering, again, the sacred cows. But so. it's also is but uh, blowing things up so that things can breathe. Indeed. So, so that things can breathe. And, 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 and also I realized that, w that w w you wear... When, when, when you are view, when your, when your culture exists in relationship to a dominant culture, which is why you've got to alter that paradigm. But if you fall into that, into that dynamic, you become hypersensitive about everything. Well, and you're writing under a gaze, exactly. Constantly, and, so. and 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 that's not truth, or that's not your truth. Right. And and also, I just wanted. I, I, I viewed, I, I wanted Colored Museum to feel like an exorcism and a party. Mm -hmm. I wanted to feel very celebratory. I wanted to feel very raw. Mm -hmm. And I wanted it to feel very irreverent. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember there were times where I was writing something and part of me would giggle because I knew I was doing, I was being bad. And transgressive. Yeah, yes. and, yeah and, 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 but I didn't stop. So <laughs> if, okay, so what is that impulse that lets you not stop? Because for many people, we edit ourselves. What is it that allows you to give yourself the permission to say, I know I'm gonna offend some people, but I'm, I'm that, going to I think that goes back vision. to Addie Parker, Lindsay President. <laughs> my grandmother saying, you know, that, that protective, I think it goes completely and totally back to that. I also, I, I came out of the womb like that. I just okay. came out, I came out of the room, womb very, I mean, I was incredibly sensitive. You looked at me the wrong way, I would cry, but I also was very willful. I was mm -hmm. unbelievably, unbelievably willful. I would not do I was. I would just. I wouldn't eat foods. I mean, I. I. I would. I was growing up. I. I was paranoid of all these foods. And I remember one time going back to Minnie J. Hitch, my principal. My mother taught at the school, and to prove that they didn't treat me d different, they made me eat all these peas, and then my entire <laughs> face ballooned up. And I'm convinced it was my will that gave me an allergy. Anaphylactic shock. Exactly. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to do this. So, but I just think it was just a sense of, I think, and also you're obeying. I think that when you're writing. You're not, you're not obeying yourself, you're obeying the material. Yes. You have a responsibility to the story you're telling. It's not about your safety. It's not about what makes you feel comfortable. It's not, I, I, at the exact same time when I was in the dramatic program, I was writing a musical called Paradise, and that was going to be my big hit, and that was going to be my success. And in many respects, I wrote it for success, and it got massacred violently. Yes, it was by the true. critics. Colored Museum, I wrote for myself. And I went, got it. So got it. When you try to program something for success, it, it doesn't, doesn't work. work. So let's talk about that because another one of your big aphorisms, and by the way, you should have a line of pillowcases and t shirts because you're very epigrammatic. But uh, you have said you don't run through your failures, you need to walk through them. Absolutely, absolutely. So what have some of your failures taught you? Because in theater, obviously, they're always failures. Well, in that, in it, um, well, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never experienced a <laughs> fail, failure in my life. I can speak to other people's failures, you know, um, <laughs> of which there are many. No, I remember on, on Paradise, it, it was, it was, it, it was irreverent and all over the place, and I didn't direct it, and a person who was a friend of mine uh, directed it. And I remember in rehearsals, I was going, well, that doesn't seem quite the way it should be, but we're friends. Oh, I, that casting decision is wrong, but maybe I shouldn't mm -hmm. cut to the opening night of the play, a tornado was passing through <laughs> New York City. So I'm standing on the corner of 96th and Broadway mm -hmm. with torrential rain and winds blowing, reading my bad review. <laughs> so 
you were so, sort of King Lear in so the final exactly, scene in the exactly, Tempest. Exactly, exactly. Oh, he wins. Know, exactly. And so I went, oh, got it. Thank you, God. Got for it. That got it. If if I if I ever find myself standing on the corner of 96 and Broadway, you know, reading a bad review, it's going to be because it was my vision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we are every we are in the room to make a beautiful baby. Mm -hmm. That's why we're here. We're not here to to make friends. Hopefully, we I have tons and tons of friends that I made from the from from working in the theater. But that's not why we're here. We're here to make this piece of art as beautiful and as magical and as powerful and as as generous as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. And and you and and if I had rushed through that and go to hell with the critics, I mean, I'd said to hell with the critics and all that sort of stuff. But it was very important that that in any situation you take responsibility for what you did. So it protects you from ever becoming a victim, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. ever from becoming a victim. Otherwise, you don't grow. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, then that pain was stupid and wasted. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and if you're going to go through pain, you might as well learn something from it. No, no question. You know, and what's interestingly enough, eight months, eight or nine months later, the Colored Museum happened, and all those people who wrote evil, evil, evil things about me was going, ta-da, here he is. But and it was, that was such also another blessing. Mm -hmm. Because am I doing what I do because I want people to pat me on my head and say good boy, or am I doing what I do because I have a responsibility to tell the stories that I feel need to be told? Mm -hmm. So it's just all these, every single step of the way, you just find yourself in, in these situations. And once again, what did I do? Mm -hmm. How did I contribute? How did I surrender? How did I not, how, how was I not smart or clear or available? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and so in every situation, I always just check in to see what did I do? Because I, I, victim is, victimhood is just, I have no, I can't do that. No. I just can't do that because then you're giving people more, you're giving other people power over you. Mm -hmm. And that's just yeah. not pleasant. You, you've also said, watch out who you have a baby with because whoever oh, no, you exactly. do, that's what it's going to look exactly. like. Careful so. who you, careful. <laughs> no. Careful, that's my, that's my rule about collaboration. Careful who you marry, because that who's the child is going to look like. Exactly, exactly. You and I go, oh, my so, genes are so strong. No, regardless no, no. of no, that, whatever, they're going to mix. And it's gonna, <laughs> it, that's the way it's going to turn out looking. Exactly. So there are things that you've taken on, and you've said it was almost because you didn't know how to do them. So you, you, you embrace challenge. What have been some of the most daunting things that you've taken on? Well, Angels in America, I was going, how the hell do you direct a seven-hour play? <laughs> I mean, it's just sort of, I was just with like, it's seven hours. How? How? Yeah. How? And, and there's an angel flying. And, and, and you know, and then, and, and then I went like, oh, like everything else, one scene at a time. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, you know, you can't take on the enormity of anything. You, 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 you approach it the way you approach every single thing. You write one line or you direct one moment and then you direct another moment and then you keep on going and keep on going until you end up with something. Mm -hmm. and, 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 having, and having the faith in, 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 in your own skill set and the people that you're working with. I, I, you know, I, I did a production of the Caucasian Chalk Circle at, mm. at the Which public. Which is the Brecht piece, Brecht, Brecht, yes. at, when, 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 when Joe Papp was still alive. And we had a reading around the table. When you work on a play, you spend a lot of time reading the play. And the next day of the rehearsals, I, the table was gone. And I started staging because I was thinking very selfishly because I went, this is a big project. I need to take this on now. And I wasn't thinking about the people who were in the play. Mm -hmm. And as a result of it, the actors who performed the play brilliantly never had any degree of confidence because I took their journey away as well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and anytime you, do, anytime you direct a play, you're sitting around the table, it inevitably happens. You're sitting around the table, you're talking, you're asking questions, you're talking, asking questions. Something begins to happen to the actors. They begin to organically start to stand up, start to move around. They will announce when they're ready. And so you just have to, it, you have to, it isn't reading the room, it's, because you are driving the room and you are shaping the room, you are shaping the room so that everybody can discover and play. And it's important that you let people to be, 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 uh, discover and play so that therefore they bring 
pieces of themselves to the material and they bring their truth and their pain and their loss to the material and if you shut that down they will act but without that same degree of intimacy mm -hmm. and that's what an audience responds to yep. an audience thinks they're responding to the play and they are but what they're responding to is the nakedness of the artist before them well, it's, and if yep. and if you violate that it, they won't bring that same sense degree of vulnerability yep. it's what barbara cook said get up there and show the audience what life has done to you. It's so, really painfully so, true. It's also, exactly. it's, it's very interesting because I, when, when a movie is working, you lean back in your seat. Mm -hmm. When theater is working, you lean forward mm -hmm. because you're seeing your own fragility merit, merit on stage. Mm -hmm. and, and, and there are a whole series of decisions and, 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 a, and a dynamic of safety and care. Mm -hmm. that you and chaos mm -hmm. that you have to create in the room so that that dynamic flourishes and grows mm -hmm. absolutely so in terms of fragility let's talk about Iceman cometh because you've got 18 extraordinarily fragile characters on stage played by extraordinarily fragile brilliant actors who... ranging from Denzel Washington to um, and, and I, uh, yeah, Austin Butler, who is yes. making his Broadway debut, who's a brilliant young actor. He's magnificent. Yeah. And, and David Morse, who was yeah, nominated for the Tony. Exactly. So this is a, it's a very tough play. And from what I understand, you were not this gushing Eugene O'Neill fan dying to direct a Eugene O'Neill play. So tell us a little bit about the decision to, to take this mammoth project on because well, it, it's you, 18 people on stage practically the entire time. Yeah, yes. Um, I, 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 I What's, what's really interesting, if you read O'Neill, it's very interesting because he writes the most insane, anal, controlling, manipulative stage directions. Yes. So I want to go, I want to look out the window the character looks out the window, he pauses, he lifts an eyebrow, he considers whether or not it's true, and then he does it. And so you read this crap, and it took me four years to get through act one from reading all of his unbelievable right, we know, right down to what people look like. All the, now, the one... and, and part of it is like he lived with these guys. He lived with these guys. Not that that was based on his life. It was his written life, in 1939, but he lived in a rooming exactly. house in 1912. He totally with... lived there. And, he, and one of the things that he said, cause, you know, he had a very famous actor father, and he felt yes. judged perpetually. And he said, living in these two uh, bar rooming houses, he learned to never judge anyway. So there's such, there's on um, one level, such incredible care and affection that he feels for those people. And you also sense there's a sort of incredible lack of faith that he has in the actors because he's trying <laughs> to control every single thing that you did. So that, so that was just a kind of hell. And then once I got past that, it was hell. And then and, and also, you're waiting on Hickey, you're waiting on Hickey, you're waiting on Hickey, you're waiting on Hickey, you're waiting on the Hickey. The main character who yeah. doesn't show up until the very end, end, end of, of a very one. long act one. Exactly, exactly. And then, well, I don't think it's that act one <laughs> long in my version, but... No, it, it so, flies no, but, but, by in your version, hey, Thank you, thank you, thank you. He said deluding himself. <laughs> yeah, it's five minutes, five minutes, like that. And um, and then two and three and four are just... there is majestic writing, and so... I was going, how, how, how you, what is this? I don't know how to do this damn act one. Well, and let's be clear for those who haven't seen it, that it opens on a bunch of drunks in a bar, but most of them passed out. Yes, so. <laughs> start the scene. <laughs> Woo, exactly. exciting. Exactly. <laughs> Action. Exactly, a musical number, exactly. <laughs> I'm drunk, I'm drunk. When is Hickey coming? I'm drunk, here I am. Um, so, um, and, and so, so that was a process. So one of the things that I did in preparing the script for the cast, I got rid of every single stage direction. Ex okay. Just so we, so the, it could, could be, be a free. new play. So yes. it could be a new play. Mm -hmm. and, um, and one of the things that's interesting as we began to work on the play, I began to discover his sense of American, but very specifically New York vernacular. Mm -hmm. is stunning yes and 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 you realize when you start to work on it that it is a gigantic musical composition mm -hmm. and 
one of the things that people think, which I violently disagree with, is that, you know, that all the experimentation and form that Eugene O'Neill did in the beginning of his career, Harry Ape, Emperor Jones, you know, all these plays that he did, finally he arrived and wrote these mature Right, the, it's the triumvirate. Plays, it's triumphant that triumphant long play. day's journey into night and moon for the mist exactly, that gotten exactly, our, exactly. the apex uh, that's, of that's his creation. That's the journey that he got to. And I disagree with that. I b believe that every single, all the experimentation in form is present in Iceman Cometh. Mm -hmm. Also, he said in the year 1912, when he was a very young ma yes. man, that year in 1912, he tried to commit suicide. He went to Argentina, uh, uh, acquired a, a, a venereal disease from a prostitute, got a divorce. He did, and in order to get a divorce, he went to a whorehouse, which is across the street at the time from the Lyceum Theater. He selected a prostitute, went up to the room, his lawyer and his wife's lawyer came up to the room to, to witness. witness him in bed mm -hmm. so that infidelity could be proven. He uh, contracted t tuberculosis. All of these things happened in, 19, in 1912. That is not the energy of an, that, so he said it in 1912, and also the year that he decided to become a serious writer. Mm -hmm. So all that restlessness and despair and anguish and what am I, what am I doing? Oh, I, I want to kill myself. No, I want to live. What's going on? All of that is embedded in that language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All of that is embedded in his writing. That's mm -hmm. why he said it then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Robert Edmund Jones, who, who, who was brilliant designer and who designed Iceman Cometh and all, almost all of his plays, I found this wonderful quote of his which said, realism is something we do when we don't fill up to that extra effort. <laughs> <laughs> And once again, yeah. that quote liberated me to think about this material mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in fun and challenging well, ways. And he did, though, have to transport himself back 27 exactly. Exactly. years exactly. to exactly. relive those moments. Exactly, exactly. So the play, though, also has, it, it, there's an eternal element to it, but there are a lot of parallels to that year 1912 and what's going on in that bar in terms of the discussion. And today, there is a character who's written as black, who yes. basically talks about white supremacy. It's, it's, it's astonishing the things that Joe Mott says in the play. Yeah. He talks about he, 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 talks, he, 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 he talks about his delusion, his pipe dream is that he's going to open up a gambling house. And he tells these two guys, he, said, he says, come to the opening, I'll treat you white. You win, that's golden. You lose, it don't count. Can't treat you any whiter than that. It's an astonishing. Yeah. And the audience applauds. applauds when that. It's astonishing that Eugene O'Neill, mm -hmm. it's I was going like, well, go O'Neill. I mean, you know, it's like <laughs> He was who, woke. Who knew? Who knew? <laughs> who knew? And it's it's really fa and, and and one of the things that I thought was really fascinating to me about the piece is that the, the relationship that liquor plays that once Hickey shows up and confronts all these people they stop drinking and so the liquor is numbing their the unresolved rage inside of them mm -hmm. and and that was one of the things that i found really really fascinating that he gave joe mott access to his rage he gave uh the three prostitutes access to their rage all these characters are allowed to experience their rage in a startling startling way when you think about that it was, you know, when it was written and, 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 and the world that it was written for, mm -hmm. it's fascinating. Well, and there's the disillusioned and paralyzed left. <laughs> there are all of these exactly, leftists who've abandoned the cause. Exactly, exactly. So, who are feeling completely bereft. Exactly, so. and also b believing that, that, the, that the people who are fighting the injustices of the world are just as corrupt because ultimately they want the power. Mm -hmm. And so it's really, it's, it's a very, very, I, so I, I went from, uh, yeah, yeah, Eugene O'Neill, important American playwright, yeah, let's honor him to going, oh my God. This is, you, he's extraordinary, he's, he's a brilliant, He's a brilliant, brilliant, authentic, generous, and available American voice. It's mm -hmm. astonishing. Mm -hmm. It's been, it's, you know, I, I always when you do a project, you think you're doing it for one reason, and you end up finding out you're doing it for another reason. So mm -hmm. that's always fun. No, yes, that discovery. Yeah. So you've always responded to the political moment, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, you've written and spoken eloquently about the despair in the wake of 9-11 and finding hope again. 
And where are you now <laughs> in this moment, this beautiful moment in our country? Well, it's, um, it, it depends. Sometimes I'm at my window going, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> and then other times I'm trying to put it in my work. It's mm -hmm. um, w one of the things that I think th that I was that I, I was thinking for a while is all the muscles that we evolved, that we've evolved over time, were not for the previous eight years. Mm -hmm. They were there for now. Mm -hmm. You know, they're for now. They're they're, are, they're for now, and 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 it is very important that because I think what's at stake is human decency. And so, and so, in in many respects, human care for other people becomes a political act. Mm -hmm. Reaching out to other people becomes a political act. And that's what your chalk circle was about. You, you know, was uh, uh, nurturing uh, uh, exactly, as a political act. Exactly, and live. You know, but having faith mm -hmm. becomes a political act in the presence of cynical small, dark little people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I think it's really fascinating because I think there are two kinds of people. And I think this applies to art, I think this applies to love, I think this applies to everything. You either rise to the demand of the situation you find yourself in, or you shrink that situation down to what makes you feel comfortable. That's it. When you find yourself in love with someone, you go, oh, can I rise to the occasion that this requires, or do I shrink this feeling down to something that makes comfortable? And leadership is unquestionably that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. do, I, do I rise, how do I rise to the responsibility? I remember this moment very specific. This is a small, insignificant moment, but I remember I was, I, I, right after college, I moved to L.A. and I was doing theater in L.A., you know, hello. And then I decided to move to New York. And on the way, I, was, I ended up doing a play in San Antonio. And I was working with a group of actors of varying experience. And, and someone did something stupid or wrong. And I yelled. What? I just lost my yeah. temper. Yeah. One minute later, one actor yelled at another actor. Then another actor yelled at another Ooh. actor. Then another actor yelled at another actor. I said, oh, I gave permission for that. Mm -hmm. You set the tone. I set the tone. I set the tone. So that leadership is not just embodying the power of the position. It is setting the tone. It's creating a room that allows. And so when you, when you behave in an ugly manner, it allows the lesser that exists inside of all of us to emerge. Mm -hmm. And we're in the presence of that. It's really. I say fascinating because it kind of gives me some vague sense of objectivity, but it's really, you know, it's, you know, it's, it, we're, it's, 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 a, it's a very, 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 very challenging time. And I think, once again, it, it, it requires, it's, it's, all of us are going, it's requiring, I think, all of us to, to stand, and we have to figure out what our version is of standing up. Indeed. Because there's no, I, 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 I helped to create this uh, Civil and Human Rights Museum in, in, in Atlanta, and I sort of staged the civil rights thing, and I was worked with this woman. Well, Delve into that. What is that? It's well, it was it was. I someone asked. I, I, there, there's this museum, and it's actually kind of really wonderful and kind of very good. It's 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 it's, it's in Atlanta. It's called the Center for Civil and Human Rights, mm -hmm. and they were called upon, and they they were looking for a storyteller to work on this, and so mm -hmm. they asked me to do it, and mm -hmm. I got involved, and so I staged the. Um, so I figured out a way to. I, I wanted I wanted to create a museum that 14 year old knucklehead boys mm -hmm. could get. That's smart. You know, <laughs> I said if I and so everything like there's. An ex there's an exhibit of, of, of TVs and every single channel that you turn on, there's nothing but a white supremacist from the 50s speaking their, their dogma. Mm -hmm. But you touch it, you turn it, there's, mm -hmm. and there's, there's this interactive, 
game, if you will, where you sit at a lunch counter mm -hmm. and you put your hands down and you close your eyes and you, and you sit in the stool and, you, and, and these high powered earphones create the, the sounds of someone surrounding you at a sit-in mm. and threaten mm. to you. Mm -hmm. And it's rigged so that therefore when they kick the stool, the stool is rigged. Ooh. So that you respond to it, yeah. and it lasts, and is how long can you last without lifting your hands to defend yourself? Mm -hmm. So it's all these interactive things. But one of the things that was created was the ones that Jill Savage, this woman who who worked on the on the uh, human rights thing, spoke point to. It's like, you know, in 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 the presence of human rights violations, no one is innocent. A bystander is an enabler. Mm. Indeed. So we're all. You know, so it, we all have a choice because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to do nothing is to is, is a to choice. Em, is it's a choice, to empower. and is is to empower those who are doing things that they should not yeah. do. All so that's things. where we are, and it's it, it's a it's a really it's, it's really it's a curious time. I don't mean curious like oh that's curious, but it's like because hmm, we're I think we're all leaning in. Mm -hmm. I think we're, it's, it's requiring something that I think hasn't been required in us in a very long time. And so how is that affecting what you're working on? The play is going to close on July 1st. Are you, what are you working on next? And is it informed by this I'm sure it will be, but I don't know how. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, you, I think it's, it's so interesting that I, I Clarity comes after. Clarity comes at one point in the process, but clarity doesn't come at the beginning right. of the process. So I don't read. I mean, I you know, God willing, it it will. But I don't know yet. I mean, I'm I'm writing a screenplay. I'm writing a play. Mm -hmm. um, I might be doing another play on Broadway in the spring, but where? <laughs> But we didn't hear it here. Figure, figure, <laughs> figure that out. And I don't know. I'm just. Um, and also, I haven't. It's 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 interesting because living inside of O'Neill, I you know, you know, it sounds like a living inside of O'Neill. Uh, <laughs> I'm 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 anxious to visit what I think from mm -hmm. having done so. Yes. You yes. know what I mean. I'm yes. anxious to and go to digest. Yeah. And and who how because I I think every time you work on a a, a project it transforms you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know I think a piece of you also dies that you don't get back you can replenish it but I think when you when you make something you know it's it uh, it it takes what it takes out of you so I'm but so I'm curious to see how you know how you know I've been altered because I don't know that yet mm -hmm. it's also taken a while it, and also when you work on something like that which is brilliantly written, or you work on Angels of America, which is brilliantly written, or Top Dog Gunner, which is brilliantly written, you surrender, you have to surrender you. And then pieces of you can show up in the job that you're doing, but you have to surrender your voice and find your voice inside the voice. Indeed. So, Indeed. so I'm really, so I'm now in the, so I've just recently regained your my own. brain back, <laughs> uh, you know. Which was invaded by Eugene O'Neill. Invaded, so. beaten up, clobbered, and destroyed. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I mean, four <laughs> acts. It's like, who the hell writes four acts? I go like, I do, I'd stage three acts, and I go, okay, I'm done. And then you know, Elaine Stritch told me this brilliant story. She said when she was 18 and drinking, she was in a play on Long Island, and it was she was doing uh, Private Lives. Mm -hmm. And she did act one, act two, and then she'd been drinking a little bit early, and she went home back to her dormitory, and she was there, and the stage manager knocked on the door and said, Elaine, would you like to come back and do act three? <laughs> <laughs> That's how I felt working on Ice Man Comet. Well, I finished Act Three. Would you like to do Act Four, George? I said, Sure, why not? Yeah. Why not? Let's finish this thing. Exactly. So, my last question before we open it up to the audience: You've talked about the need to protect the joy in the process, and oh, how, absolutely. How do you do that for yourself? I think with this incredible sense of play. I think mm -hmm. I think with an incredible sense of play and. You know, it's uh, because then I, otherwise bitterness will, what's the phrase? So it's the Camilla Williams, the opera singer who yeah. premiered Cho Cho San in 1943 who said you don't want to get bitter, bitter poisons your song. Bitter poisons your song, which is stunning. Mm -hmm. So you, I think an incredible sense of play. I think mm -hmm. you have to create an incredible sense of play. You got to give permission for people to fail. Mm -hmm. You got to get permission to fail. 
Tanya Pinkins told me that I said, which I don't remember saying, but it's a good saying, which is brilliance exists in an idea that might not work. Mm. And I don't remember saying it, but I... It, I'm, it's, it's in one of the articles that I yeah. read on you, yes. And, it's, so. and, that's, and I guess I said it. So yes. it's like, you know, and, and, and the per permission, to, per permission to not know. Mm -hmm. Permission, I mean, when, when I work on a play, I do tons and tons of research and I learn, if it's a period piece, I learn as much about the piece and I, you know, I study, read as much as I can and then let that go so that therefore I can be available to the unknown. When I, I did a production of Tempest, and I ended up staging all these sort of like these puppet effects. And then th about four months later, I found a, a journal where I had drawn the pictures of the effects and I have no recollection of drawing them before I staged them. Because I think you have to just s surrender, surrender to, to the moment and to the unknown. So I think that's, and, and, and also work with people who approach who I, I I also believe that there's that there's I, I don't I don't think people are consciously brave I think we all have fear mm -hmm. but I think it's just very important that our curiosity be larger than our fear Mm -hmm. If our curiosity is larger than our fear, we go forward. Mm -hmm. If our fear is larger than our curiosity, we stay where we are. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important to work with people who are curious and daring. And uh, I remember at one point when we were working on Shuffle Along, Savion was teaching Audra a step, and I wasn't crazy about the step. And at one point she thought I was judging her. I said, no, 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 I just want him to make something uh, you know, different for you. She said, make it harder. <laughs> and I just love that. That courage. That make it harder. I yeah. can do it. I want, once again, I want something that exists beyond me so I can reach for that thing. Even yeah. if I fail, I'm going to end up knowing something about myself more than if I, 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 I stay here and hide and I'm in a safe place. So I think the, the risk of failure, you know, and the risk of discovering and being free to not know is 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 how you hold on to the joy and also stopping anyone who tries to stop that joy mm. you know to stop that joy mm -hmm. you know just you say no you yeah. no back away mm -hmm. I, you know satan get thee behind exactly me. exactly <laughs> you know exactly you know well we've got a room full of supportive joyous people here whose curiosity definitely exceeds their fear so i'm going to open it up to them for any questions they may have yes we oh have my god somebody. there are lights oh my god Hi, Mr. Wolf. That I'm is a, the lovely Irena Stennis, the I'm fabulous a, Irena Stennis. Thank you, Susan. I'm a huge admirer. I have two questions very briefly. One is, how much liberty did O'Neill's estate give you to, one, not follow his stage direction, <laughs> uh, and two, to cast Hickey as a as an African-American man? Um, and then the second question is, um, I've read that you are very passionate about bringing Shuffle Along to, to the stage, and I'd like to know um, why was that so important to you? Thank you. All right. Uh, the O'Neill Estate was very available. Uh, I mean, cutting out the stage direction was just like, I mean, it's, it's, I, I think on any project you sort of do it so that therefore you could find it and discover it. So, so they, they didn't have any objections. and. You know, and they're clearly s smart because only a dumb person would say no to Denzel, <laughs> <laughs> who's such a brilliant actor to play to to play Hickey, and he, he's putting in, I think, an extraordinary performance. So, you he's, know, fortunately, they were available and smart. He's also not the first African American to play. The, James Earl Jones, 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 Jones did, did it in the seventies. Uh, Sh Shuffle Along was very important to me. I had I, I'd read, oh, Paul Robeson was a replacement in Shuffle Along. I went, oh, really? Oh, uh, and, and this little fact and that little fact. And I read all the, you know, in U.B. Blake's parents were slaves 
and his dream was to write a Broadway musical. And I found that so incredibly astonishing and that it ran and that it integrated Broadway and it was a catalyst for for the slumming process of downtown going uptown. And I read all these extraordinary facts and then, and that it, it was this huge hit and it was so popular they added a midnight show and all these things and it toured around. And when it toured around America, all these theaters that, pre that previously had been segregated were integrated all of a sudden. And then I found this photo book of uh, the Amer Broadway theater from, from 1890 something until 1940 or whatever. And it was the year, it was, a, it was, it was, it was, the, it, it was this, uh, and the year that they had to shuffle along, they had a list of all the shows. And then they had a footnote. And then they had this obscure play, this obscure play, this obscure play, and then shuffle along. And I was just struck and startled how something that was so redefining that launched Got, Josephine Baker and Freddie Washington. And, and, all, the th and all these people, Freddie, exactly. How did it get turned into a footnote? Mm -hmm. What, how did that, foot, how, do, how do we do, how does that happen? How do we do that? How do we take something that really, really matters and was so vital and so crucial, how do we turn it into a footnote? So that was, that was I was just curious about that. And, and also I was fast, and, and the more I read about it, and the more I read about it, all the people that were involved, it just, it just, they, they just filled and up all my heart. The firsts. What? The first love song between a black man and a black woman on stage. Yeah, exactly. Love and will the, find a way. And the first musical with, 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 with syncopation. And, and, and you read that, uh, uh, that um, Florence Ziegfeld hired the chorus girls. I was also the first women's dancing chorus on Broadway. Because women prior to that time in the other musicals were treated as ornamentation. There were dancing women and they were dancing duos, but never whole chorus. And that, and that was the first dancing hoofing chorus. But so all of that stuff. You have to share the Flo Ziegfeld story, though. Oh, the Ziegfeld, the, after the success of Shuffle Along, Ziegfeld hired the chorus girls from Shuffle Along to teach the chorus, the Ziegfeld girls, how to dance. <laughs> You know. Does that and, sound and, familiar, Miss Jemison? <laughs> Come show these people how to do it. Okay, thank you. Bye. You're done. <laughs> and then I realized ultimately what really happened to Shuffle Along is the uniqueness and the brilliance of it was ingested and then discarded. That's ultimately what happened. Yeah. More questions? Yes, Yolanda. Is there, is there a story that you're dying to tell that you haven't told yet? Oh, that's very interesting. Um, I'm one of the stories that I'm obsessed with a lot. And if I, well, what the hell, is there's a story of Oda Benga. The author of the book is sitting in the audience, Pamela Newkirk. Oh my goodness, there you are. <laughs> and that story is just, you know, is the story of a, of, a, of a Batwa pygmy who was brought over for the St. Louis World's Fair, you know, Judy Garland meet me in St. Louis, and uh, as part of the St. Louis de, uh, expo exposition, they had, they had sort of primitive people on display and so Oda was brought over and through a series of unfortunate circumstances ended up being displayed in the Bronx Zoo in a cage next to other primates. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's extraordinary and it, t it ties in King Leopold of Belgium and it's just one of those amazing stories where it just touches on everything. And the author, Pamela Newkirk. <laughs> wow. Um, I, I had heard that you were looking to do a film uh, on Oda Benga, and it, it would just, I cannot imagine anyone who could do more justice to his story. And what you said about either you're um, complicit or, you know, you're, you're fighting it, I, I think that's what that story is all about. So you really distilled it just in saying that. We're mm -hmm. living in a period that is very much like that period when we were, this country was anti-immigrant, anti 
um, you know, the xenophobia, the racism was just off the chain. The Irish, um, Eugene O'Neill was like reflecting how the Irish were treated mm -hmm. during that same period. So I think Oda Banga's story would really illuminate that on a, on a global plane because, I mean, you know the story. I don't know why I'm telling you. Well, also, there was this, there was this man, uh, the, the, originally they, <laughs> it's a story, just you go, it's one of those stories, you just go, if I had hair, I'd pull it out. But it's just <laughs> sort of like, you know, there was this man named Madison Grant uh, who wrote a p book called The Passing of the Great Race. And it was talking about how darker Europeans, i.e. Italians and Jews and black people, were going to contaminate the pure wasp. And he was also, interestingly enough, instrumental in altering the immigration laws. Which changed in 1924 from y'all come exactly, to exactly. maybe not. Which, which, which had a huge impact in World War, just, just before World War II started. And, and it's this exact same issue. And he, and, uh, and he was part of a group of people because originally they were going to put Oda at the Museum of Natural History, but they had gone, up. they were ex at the time were experiencing a lot of bad press because Perry had brought back some, a bunch of Eskimos and when they died, they bleached their bones and kept them. So they were having a bad period. So they said, I know, <laughs> hey kids, let's put him at the zoo. I mean, it's just the story just goes, you just go, oh, who made this shit up? Nobody. <laughs> Life makes it up. So that's 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 a story. That's one of the stories that I'm really really obsessed with. And just there's just you just read you just go oh my god oh my god. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi, Hi I'm Dee Dee Brown, and I've <laughs> had the pleasure of going to the museum in Atlanta, the Civil Rights Museum, and it is very immersive and experiential, and if you haven't been, you should definitely go. Yeah, it's kind of good. It, it's it's good, isn't it? amazing. <laughs> it is. I, plus, also, I do a play. I do plays, and plays die. And then I was just down there recently. I went, oh, it's still here. They didn't close it. <laughs> right, and so I wonder, I just wanted to hear more about like the process of putting yourself in that place of a 14-year-old knucklehead, like mm -hmm. what you... How did you come to bring all of that sort of together? Well, I, I was, well, one of the things that I made it, it's, it's like Martin Luther King was a human being with frailties, but they now, they've got a big statue of him, so he's better than us. Mm -hmm. The mythology is so large that he's better than us. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to tell, find these stories, because to me what's important about, a, Everything that I do, I, I, I want it to be, have a sense of empowerment. So I wanted to find these stories of, about ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Do you know about Claudette Cloven? Claudette Cloven was, I think, a 15-year-old black girl who refused to give up her seat nine months before Rosa Parks. And she was 15 had dark skin, was probably pregnant at the time, it's debated, mm -hmm. and the civil rights movement was brilliantly sophisticated about image. And they knew that this was not the correct image to put forth versus Rosa Parks, who was an activist, who was smart, who was educated, the whole thing. So I, you know, so that affected, so I kept on looking for these stories of ordinary people just going, no, 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 no. We're done. We're not doing that. <laughs> no, no. I don't know about what's going to happen after this moment, but we're done. And so I wanted to try to, and I also wanted to try to bring the, the, the visceral potency that theater can have to a, to a museum experience so it wasn't just, oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's nice. Oh, I didn't know that. But I want to try to play around with color and sound and light so that, so that you so that it becomes emotional. Because I remember going back to my grandmother, I remember very specifically, there was a march on Frankfurt. I'm sure everybody has historically heard about it. <laughs> but uh, Martin Luther King came to Frankfurt, Kentucky, and marched. I didn't know marched. that. You need to do a play about it. Oh, my God. <laughs> and, and, my, um, and, and my grandmother took me out of school, and mm -hmm. I marched how, with how her. How old were you? I was 
10, maybe mm -hmm. 10. And it's, it's, it's fascinating. My cousin, Teresa, who I think was probably in eighth grade, she was with a friend of hers. And at the end of the speech, they, she said, <laughs> I just love this story. They said, well, let's go get expelled because the principal told them that if anybody left, they were gonna be expelled. So they, let's go, let's go be expelled. And this man said, what did you say? And they said, our principal uh, told us we were gonna get expelled. They said, come with me. They took them backstage to Martin Luther King. They all got in the car. <laughs> they drove to Second Street School. Martin Luther King <laughs> walked into the school, into the principal's office, closed the door. No one was expelled. <laughs> and it's just, it's just these, it's just, you know, it's just those, those magical moments, moments. Those magical, those extraordinary moments where somebody was, where it, and you know, it's transformative to be in the presence of that kind of, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. be in the presence of that kind of magic at mm -hmm. that age. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just, and, and, I, and I remember those moments. And, and, and one of the things that was really fascinating, I was so young when all of that was happening, and it was all these adults. But then when I got into the research, I was going, oh my God, everybody was so young. They were babies. It's also astonishing. I think Martin Luther King got a C minus in public speaking. speaking. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So for all those teachers who underestimated you, go to hell, you know? <laughs> <laughs> go to hell. <laughs> I think we have time for a couple more questions. Yes, sir. Here comes the mic. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, thanks for coming tonight. It's been great to hear from you. Um, you know, I had the pleasure of seeing the most recent Angels in America, and you know, it's very poignant. It's very important for today and everything. But I really wanted to know what was it like for you when you actually did it originally, and being in the epicenter of the AIDS crisis and what was going on at the oh, it was, time. It's, it's, it, ah, <laughs> it was. It was so. It, it, it was such an astonishing, well, part one was completely written. So it was sacred text, you know. Someone who shall remain nameless said to me, well, everybody knows it's perfect, so it does, if it doesn't work, it's your fault. And uh, okay. <laughs> I said, thank you. And so, and, so, and so I felt, so in some respects, in addition to staging it, my job was to protect the cast from the hype that was surrounding it so we could just, so everybody could do our work and once again animate it and imbue it with that degree of intimacy. And then on part two, Perestroika, which is actually my favorite because it's messier politically and emotionally, I think I got like five acts from Mr. Tony Kushner a week before we went into rehearsal. And through the course of rehearsing, about two thirds of those acts changed. And it was really, I think it was really challenging to work on because when you rehearse, you have to be available to everything as an actor. And when you perform, you have to be in command of everything. So the actors were still performing at night, being in command of everything, then required to come in and be vulnerable to the material. And it was changing every day and it was challenging, but, and, and I tell people, I don't, I never was able to experience, have, have that virgin experience of coming in and sitting and witnessing angels the way everybody else did. But I will never forget the moment when Tony showed up and he had written this thing for the character of Belize, where he describes his vision of heaven. And he describes his vision, and at the end of it, uh, Roy Cohen, who's hopped up on drugs, says, and heaven, and he says, that was heaven, Roy, and you're not in it. Ooh. And I was just never, the speech is stunning. It's a, and so I was, I got to hear that speech before anybody else. And so those moments like that are just extraordinary. And also I remember there was a moment, the gay games were in New York the, the, that summer. And I, rem I will never forget this, this, the show ended, the audience cheered and cheered and cheered. 
The cast went off stage, changed into their street clothes, and had to come back down on stage because they were still cheering. And it's just this. It's one. It was one of those extraordinary moments. I think. I think in some respect. In respects, there's there's an ideal audience for an ideal for an ideal play. And sometimes that. And when you're in the presence of that, I think there's nothing like it. And so, and also I remember this moment because once again, when you're doing a job, it's your job to do the job, not to be affected by it and not to be aware of all the hype. And I remember there was a gay pride that there was an angel's float and I and I and the cast was there and, and I stopped by to say hi. And they said, come on right on the float right on, right on the float. And I remember this moment of people coming up to the car, to the float, crying and saying thank you. And that's when I went, began to go, oh, oh, I get it because I deliberately made myself not get it so I could perform surgery, if you will, you know? So it was, it was, extra, it was an extraordinary, it was an, an extraordinary time. It, I, I, it almost killed me. I, if I, it was at the Walter Kerr Theater, and years after that, any time I walked into the Walter Kerr Theater, my body would go, oh, 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 you know? Because I think I spent nine months of my life in that damn theater. <laughs> on opening night, I, we, we, all, we all took a curtain call. I, I was walking on a cane. I had gout. I mean, you know, it's just sort of like, you know. As Peter Stone, this a, a book writer, once said, to, said about collaboration, the patient lives and the doctors all die. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I, it's a little bit of how I felt a, on Angels. So one last question we have time for, I think, and then we're... Yes. If there were uh, to be a revival of a show that you think would be worthy, that you would um, uh, you know, aspire to direct, what might it be? Of a revival? It could Something be your own that material. You think, yes, it could. <laughs> Um, but something that you think would be you know, worthy for this current generation of theater goers. I would love to see a to revival see. called a museum done in mm -hmm. New York with a really brilliant, brilliant, brilliant cast. I would love to see that. I would really, really love to see that. Uh, there's a there's a line there's a line in that play which goes and whereas I can't live inside yesterday's pain, I can't live without it. And, and I think that's what, that's, I mean, I think that's, it, I think that's, 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 it's a question that I, I think I, it, I think it's a question that I wrestle with. What proportion of the past fuels you? And what proportion of the past suffocates you? Mm -hmm. And what proportion, and if you have, if you claim it of the past, then what, what value are you? And I think so. That that dynamic is is just something that I'm that I that I wrestle with, and, and I think that play wrestles that, with. And many people do. And, and many people and, do. And or, I, or or my fear is their it, fear, and I don't want to sound like a, a curmudgeon. I, my fear is that there are, that certain generations feel as though they don't have to. Mm -hmm. And I think you, you, each, one's history, one's history. Is one's is one's armor indeed is 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 one's armor so that you can go forward naked indeed you know what I mean and and so that's 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 a fear that's a real well, fear that I have to second that point if I may quote you to you because I want please this one do on a, on I don't a know I <laughs> <laughs> talking about what you learned from working on Jelly's Last Jam I really got over that and said I am American and that culture that I come from is American. I feel that my work is staking out a claim on a cultural landscape that has been in existence for a very long time, but people have tried to pretend it doesn't exist. I no longer view myself as being a subculture, a minority, an alternative. I am the party. I am the jam. Yes. And you are? And you have turned this green space into a party, and we love you, and we thank you. Well, thank you so much.
Thank you. I don't remember saying that, but I'm glad I did. <laughs>